is there a species that's the apex intelligence right now on Earth? So it's not trivial to say that humans are that. Yeah, it's not trivial. I agree. It, it's a, you know, I think one of the things that I, I've long been curious about kind of other intelligences, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I view intelligence is like computation and it's kind of a, you know, you're sort of, you have the set of rules, you deduce what happens. Um, I have tended to think now that there's this sort of specialization of computation that is sort of a consciousness-like thing that has to do with these, you know, computational boundedness, single thread of experience, these kinds of things that are the specialization of computation that corresponds to a somewhat human-like experience of the world. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, so so that's, you know, there may be other intelligences like, you know, you know, the aphorism, you know, the weather has a mind of its own. It's a different kind of intelligence that can compute all kinds of things that are hard for us to compute, but it is not well aligned with us, uh, with the way that we think about things. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't think the way we think about things. And, you know, in this idea of different, different intelligences, every different mind, every different human mind is a different intelligence that thinks about things in different ways. And, you know, in, in terms of the kind of formalism of our physics project, we talk about this idea of ruleal space, mm -hmm. the space of all possible sort of rule systems, and different minds are in a sense at different points in ruleal space. Human minds, ones that have grown up with the same kind of culture and ideas and things like this might be pretty close in real space, pretty easy for them to communicate, pretty easy to translate, pretty easy to move from one place in real space that corresponds to one mind to another place in real space that corresponds to another sort of nearby mind. Mm -hmm. When we deal with kind of more distant things in real space, like, you know, the, the pet cat or something, um, you know, the pet cat has some aspects that are shared with us. The emotional responses of the cat are somewhat similar to ours. But the cat is further away in real space than people are. And so then the question is, you know, can we identify sort of the, can we make a translation from our thought processes to the thought processes of, of a cat or something like this? And, you know, what what will we get when we, you know, what what will happen when we get there? And I think it's the case that that many, you know, many animals, I don't know, dogs, for example, you know, they have elaborate olfactory systems. They, you know, they they have sort of the smell architecture of the of the of the world, so to speak, in a way that we don't. And so, you know, if if you were sort of talking to the dog and you could, you know, communicate in a language, the dog will say, "Well, this is a, you know, a." A you know a, a flowing, smelling this, that, and the other thing, concepts that we just don't have any idea about. Now, what's what's interesting about that is one day we will have chemical sensors that do a really pretty good job. You know, we'll have artificial noses that work pretty well, and we might have our augmented reality system show us kind of the same map that the dog could see and things like this. So the you know similar to what happens in the dog's brain, and eventually we will have kind of expanded in real space to the point where we will have those same sensory experiences that dogs have, and we will have internalized what it means to have, you know, the smell landscape or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and so then we will have kind of colonized that part of real space um, until, you know, we haven't gone, you know, some things that, that you know, animals and so on do, we sort of successfully understand, others we do not. And the question of, of what, Kind of what is the uh, you know what what representation you know how how do we convert things that animals think about to things that we can think about that's not a trivial thing um, and you know I've I've long been curious I had a very bizarre project at one point of of trying to make an iPad game that a cat could win against its owner it's, it feels like there's a deep philosophical goal there though yes yes I mean the the you know I was curious. If you know if pets can work in Minecraft or something mm -hmm. and can construct things, what will they construct? And will what they construct be something where we look at it and we say, "Oh yeah, I recognize that," or will it be something that looks to us like something that's out there in the computational universe that one of my you know cellular automata might have produced, where we say, "Oh yeah, I can kind of see it operates according to some rules." I don't know why you would use those rules. I don't know why you would care. Yeah, I, I actually just to link on that seriously, is there a connector in the real space between you and a cat, where the cat could legitimately win? So iPad is a very limited. Um, 
interface. Yeah, I, I, I wonder I, if there's a game where cats win. I think the problem is that cats don't tend to be that interested in what's happening on the iPad. Well, so I think, yeah, that's an interface issue probably. Yeah, right, right, right. No, I, I, I think it is likely that, I mean, you know, there are plenty of animals that would successfully eat us if we were, you know, if we were exposed to them. And so there's, you know, it, it's going to pounce faster than we can get out of the way and so on. So there, there are plenty of, and, and probably it's going to, you know, we think we've hidden ourselves, but we haven't successfully hidden ourselves. But that's a physical else. strength. I wonder if there's uh, something in, in more in the realm of uh, intelligence where an animal like a cat right. could uh, out. Well, I think there are things, smartest. certainly in terms of the, the speed of processing certain kinds of things, sure. for sure. I mean, the, the question of what, you know, is there a game of chess, for example? Is there cat chess yeah. that the cats could play against each other? And if we tried to play a cat, we'd always lose. I don't know. It might have to do with speed, but it might have to do with concepts also. It, there might be concepts in the cat's head. I, I tend to think that our species, from its invention of language, has managed to build up this kind of tower of abstraction that for things like a chess-like game will make us win. In other words, we've yeah. become, through the fact that we've kind of experienced language and learnt abstraction, you know, we've sort of become smarter at those kinds of abstract kinds of things. Now, you know, that doesn't make us smarter at catching a mouse or something. It makes us smarter at the things that we've chosen to to sort of, con you know, to concern ourselves, which are, are these kinds of abstract things. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, this is, again, back to the question of, of you know, what does one care about? You know, if one's, a, if one's, the you know the cat if you if you have the discussion with a cat if we can if we can translate things to have the discussion with a cat the cat will say you know i'm very excited that uh this light is moving and we'll say why do you care and the cat will say that's the most important thing in the world yeah. that this thing moves around i mean it's like when you ask about, I don't know, you you look at archaeological remains and you say, these people had this, you know, belief system about this, and you know, that was the most important thing in the world to them. Um, and and now we look at it and say we don't know what the point of it was. I mean, I I've been curious, you know, there are these handprints on caves from twenty thousand or more years ago. And it's like nobody knows what these handprints were there for, mm -hmm. you know, that they may have been a representation of the most important thing you can imagine. They may just have been some, you know, some kid who who rubbed their hands in the mud and stuck them on the walls of the cave. You know, we don't we don't know. And I think, but this this whole question of what, um, you know, is when you say uh, this question of sort of what's the smartest thing around. There's the question of what kind of computation are you trying to do. If you're saying, you know, if you say. Uh, you've got some well-defined computation, and how do you implement it? Well, you could implement it by nerve cells, you know, firing. You can implement it with silicon and electronics. You can implement it by some kind of molecular computation process in the human immune system or in some molecular biology kind of thing. There are different ways to implement it, and you know, I think this question of of uh, of sort of which, you know, those different implementation methods will be of different speeds, they'll be able to do different things. If you say, uh, you know, which, so an interesting question would be, um, what kinds of abstractions are most natural in these different kinds of systems? So for a cat, it's, for example, you know, the visual scene that we see you might, you know, we pick out certain objects, we recognize, you know, certain things in that visual scene. A cat might, in principle, recognize different things. Mm -hmm. I, I suspect, you know, evolution, biological evolution is very slow. And I suspect what a cat notices is very similar. And we even know that from some neurophysiology. What a cat notices is very similar to what we notice. Of course, there's a, you know, one obvious difference is, Cats have only two kinds of color receptors, so they don't see in the same kind of color that we do. Now, you know, we say we're, we're, we're better, we have three color receptors, you know, red, green, blue. We're not the overall winner. Mm -hmm. I, think the, the, uh, I think the mantis shrimp is the overall winner, winner with 15 color receptors, I think. So it can, it can kind of make distinctions that with our current, you know, like the mantis shrimp's view of reality is... In, at least in, in terms of color, is much richer than ours. Mm -hmm. um, now, but what's interesting is how do we get there? 
So imagine we have this augmented reality system that is even, you know, it's seeing into the infrared, into the ultraviolet, things like this, and it's translating that into something that is connectable to our brains, either through our eyes or more directly into our brains, um, you know, then eventually our kind of web of the types of things we understand will extend to those kinds of constructs just as they have extended. I mean, there are plenty of things where we see them in the modern world because we made them with technology, and now we understand what that is. Mm -hmm. But if we'd never seen that kind of thing, we wouldn't have a way to describe it, we wouldn't have a way to understand it, and so on.